country is, and really it's always been there. It might have been a little more friendly to Christianity in the past. But really we've always been in a place where we have to look different than the culture around us. But even as, as we continue to move forward, so much is happening that is just opposing the gospel. And, and we're living in, in, in times that are growing more hostile to Christianity and attacking the faith and making it harder for believers to live in society in a way that we're called to live. You, like me, I'm sure, deal with times in your life where you're like, okay, I'm called to live this way, but how am I going to do that in this situation? How am I going to do that in this society? Like, if we really look at what, how Scripture calls us to live and what our society is proclaiming today, they will look completely like they're two different things. So how do you do that? How do you live in a godless society, a society that's moving further and further away from God? How do you do that? And so this is what this, is what this letter that Paul writes to Titus is all about. It's about how to live in a society that's hostile to Christianity so that, listen, so that we may shine and share the gospel that we proclaim. And, don't miss this, so that the society that we live in, hold it, here it comes, doesn't become the enemy, but stays the mission field. Did you hear that? As we live in a society like we live in today, we are tempted more and more to make those who disagree with us or whom we disagree with or whom we deem as unworthy as the enemy. We alienate them. We separate from them. And we snub our noses at them. Or we just decide not to engage life with them. And in so doing, we make them the enemy instead of the mission field. We isolate ourselves from them instead of engaging them with the gospel. And we can't do that. We can't do that. God, listen, God has sovereignly placed you and me in this day and age to be the light of the gospel to a godless society. And so how can we, how can we live in such a way that will make the gospel attractive, that will draw people to the gospel, that will provide a platform for the gospel to go forth so that we may impact this society for the gospel? Now, I'll preface this by saying, I'm going to spend a little more time not playing on the introduction, but here we go. I'll preface this by saying this. What I'm about to preach, what, what, what God's Word says this morning, is not going to resonate with you if... Your heart's desire is not to bring this society to Jesus. These godless folks that we live in, if your heart's desire is to just say, hey, I want to live my life. I don't want you to step on my rights. I want to, I want to do what I want to do. I want to live how I want to live. I just don't want you to invade my space and let me live the way I want to live. If you just kind of want to separate yourself from this society that's growing hostile to what you believe and you don't care about their salvation, that you're more focused on yourself than their salvation, then this message is not going to resonate with you. This message is really going to challenge you. It might even make you mad. But if your heart's desire from the word of God and the heart of God is for the salvation of mankind, which is the heart of God, he wants all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth, then, then this message is going to be like a breath of fresh air, a drink of cool water to say, oh, that's how I can do it. But if it's just about you and you stay secluded, this might just make you mad. So I'm just preparing for that, okay? So if you need to say, God, uh, move me to want their salvation right now so I don't leave the church mad today, then go ahead and do that right now. Just ask him, <laughs> ask him to move your heart there so this word lands, lands well with us today. So Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. We're reading the first eight verses of Titus chapter 3 this morning. I'll go back to, to 15 because we didn't hit that last week, and I'll just say this. Paul tells Timothy to declare these things, to, the gospel of, of, of why Christ saved him. It's all these things that he shared with, with Titus. 
He says, declare these things, exhort rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you. Titus was to preach the gospel, was to preach these things, declare these things, encourage others in that, and rebuke them when they're out of line with that. That's what the authority of the Word of God does for us. And then he says this, Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when, let me go back, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. All right. So how do we live in society? We well, tell us there in verse 1 to be submissive to our authorities, submissive to our rulers. Submissive to our government, submissive to those folks who are in authority over them, over us. So apparently, the Cretans were a very rebellious bunch. Okay, I don't know if being under Roman oppression, kind of like Israel was, I don't know if being under Roman oppression kind of made them resent Rome or, and resent authority and resent the way they were wanting to, to lead them. But but they were kind of a rebellious bunch. I think the Greek, I wrote this down, the Greek historian Polybius. Um, and said that they were, the Cretans were insurrectionists, murderers, prone to conflict. And so they were kind of rebellious. But if, if you think about it, the Cretans aren't unlike us, are they? And if we want to go a certain way, we're kind of a rebellious bunch too, aren't we? We don't like authority. We don't like to submit ourselves, especially to authority that we disrespect or authority that we, we don't agree with or authority that we think is ungodly and doesn't deserve our respect, that we consider maybe unworthy. And so what Paul is trying to get Titus to teach these Christians to do is to say, look, maybe because the gospel just goes against culture, maybe the Christians are going to get labeled as being just a rebellious, anti-state, anti-government, just create, you know, uh, uh, contentiousness, you know, just all that. They, they, they might be maligned as that, but look, I want you to teach them to obey their authority, to obey the government, to submit to what the government tells you to do. Submit to what your rulers and your authorities tell you to do. Now, we've always had ungodly rulers and ungodly authorities throughout the course of our country and the history of the world. Okay, so does this mean that if there's an ungodly authority or an ungodly ruler, should we submit to their authority? And the answer, the scripture answers right here is yes, we should. Remember, the Cretans were living under the rule of Roman society, or, or Roman government. Ro Romans were pagans. They, they, were, they, they were contrary to the gospel. But Paul tells the Cretans to submit to their authority. We don't want to give across the impression that we are people who are rebellious and who just want to go our own way and do our own thing, no matter what the authority set up by God above us tell us to do. These things are affirmed. I won't, I won't take you there. But I put these in your going further. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. And 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. Both affirm submission to authority. So we pay our taxes even though we think we're taxed too much. We obey speeding laws. Even though we think it's absolutely ridiculous that that's a hill going down. How can I go 40 miles an hour? 
We obey our civil authorities. We submit to them. But the only time, the scripture does, you know, the only time that we would not do this, we, this is where we take scripture in totality. If we just don't submit. If, if like maybe in other countries, uh, you know, if, if in our country population control was, was, was trying to, to be handled through, you know, forced abortions after, you know, however many kids, we obviously wouldn't abort our kids because that's going against God's word. If, if our government tells us to not share the gospel and speak the gospel, obviously we disobey that because the word of God tells us to do that. When, when what mankind, when what man, mankind's authorities tell us to do contradicts what the Word of God tells us to do, obviously what do we do? We'll be the Word of God. That's what Acts chapter 5, I think verse 29 says, you know, when Peter and, and his guys were, were, were told to, to not preach the gospel, he said, we must obey God rather than men. And it got him beaten for it. It got him punished for it. So even if our obedience to God brings punishment or consequence to us, we obey God. As a matter of fact, so many people in, in history have lost their lives because they refused to worship the rulers of this world. And they decided yet to worship the God of the Word. They wouldn't bow down and say Caesar is God. They said, no, I won't do that. And they lose their lives because of it. They won't recant their faith because the government tells them to do that. So they lose their lives. We, we, if, even if obeying the word of God costs us consequence, we do. But the scriptures teach, especially in Romans 13, that God, God has set up governments, even, even ours, for the good of mankind. In a lot of ways, our government is a good good thing. And so it's not contradicting the word. We submit. We obey. Because we don't want to be seen as rebellious and, and in ways that would that would harm or taint our gospel witness. That would cut us off from being an effective light in society. And so we submit to our earthly authorities. Dr. Ironside says this. He he must not plead heavenly citizenship in order to free himself from his responsibilities as an earthly citizen. And so this is where it kind of hits home with us. Because of our pride, we don't like to submit, especially to those that we disrespect, resent, disagree with, consider unworthy. But we must look different and not be seen as rebellious that will hinder our witness. These Cretans were called to look different than the Cretans around them. And by submitting to the authority, there's one less thing that the state can say, you're an enemy of us. And it, and, and it, and it can help push forward the gospel witness when we obey. And the scripture calls us to, to obey. And then he says in verse 1 as well, he says to be ready for every good work. Now I want to take you back to chapter 1, verse 16. Paul's talking about the false teachers, and he says the false teachers are unfit for any good work. And so Christians are supposed to stand opposed to the false teachers who, who are, they're unfit for any good work, but Christians are supposed to stand out as those who do good works, who do good deeds, who, who, who live lives of, of, of good works and good deeds. Contrary to the false teachers. As a matter of fact, in, 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 uh, in chapter 2, verse 14, he says that God saved us to purify us and make us a people, watch this, talked about this last week, who are zealous for good works. Now that word zealous and be ready for every good work, listen to that terminology. That is not the person who's sitting on their couch, right, who hears about a need in society or sees, uh, sees an area of the, of the community that needs needs help and assistance and all that kind of stuff, and you are really binge-watching this, this show that you, you're, you, you're really loving and you're enjoying, and you're enjoying time with your kids and your family and all this kind of stuff, and you're in your regular routine, and this, but, but, the, but, but the welfare of society is calling out to you, and you're like, <clears throat> maybe if somebody calls me, I'll pray about doing it. I don't want to do it. I want to stay right here. 
No, what, what Scripture is calling us to do is to be zealous for good works, to be passionate about good works, to be ready for it, to, to sit with anxious anticipation to say, I want to do what I can to help society, be, to, to assist, and to encourage, and to build others up. We don't have to be forced to do good works. We don't have to be forced to get involved in ministering to others. We don't have to be forced to get involved in our schools and in our, in our civic organizations and things like that. We don't have to get, be forced to go help people in society. We're ready for it. We're zealous for it. It's a mark. It's an identifying mark of the believer. This, this is where I think it attacks us. We are a church, I think, that does a lot of good things in our community and in our world. Celebrated Africa, you know, we, 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 we do things in our community. But I, I, and I, all those are great. I don't want to malign those at all. But I wonder, are we zealous for good works in our life? Are we ready for good works? Are we chomping at the bit to go do whatever we can for the good of this society that sometimes we look at as godless and ungodly and not worthy of my attention. We're to be ready for every good work. Doing good for all, Galatians 6 says. Especially those in the church, but doing good to all nonetheless. Ephesians 2.10 says that's what we were saved for. We were created in Christ for good works. Jesus purified you, Titus 2.14, to be a people who are zealous for good works. Verse 8, we just read it in chapter 3. Remember this gospel, we'll get that in a minute, so that we may be devoted to good works. How you doing with that? How you doing with being a person who is zealous for good works? Christians should be some of the most helpful people anyone knows. No matter how worthy you think they are. Words are meaningless without works. Graceful lives prove our gracious salvation. I told this to the youth this morning. You can preach the gospel all day long, but nobody wants to hear it until they see it lived out in your life. And when we do good works, when we do good deeds, when we show the grace of the gospel by helping those who either can't help themselves or maybe even are not worthy of grace. When we do that, when we show that, we, we create a path for the words of the gospel to just come and mean so much more. Are you zealous for good works? And then he says, in, in verse 2, he says, um, to speak evil of no one, and, I, and I'll refer to this as not being slanderous. We're not slandering people. We're not maligning people, to not be quarrelsome, but to be gentle and courteous, considerate to all people. So let's just deal with these one at a time really quickly. Speaking evil of no one, it means not reviling people, cursing people. I'm not just talking about using curse words, but I'm talking about, you know, uh, stirring up strife, maligning people, talking about people, gossiping about people, just tearing people down. Here's the thing. It's so easy to tear down politicians. It's so easy to tear down our earthly rulers. It's so easy to tear down those people we disagree with. It's so easy to tear down a society that's going away from God. It's so easy to tear down groups of people. It's so easy to tear down people we don't agree with. It's so easy to tear down people. But when you tear down people, you alienate them relationally, but you also alienate them in your mind. And you create an incredible barrier to reaching them for the gospel. When you talk about people, when you run people down, you push them away. And our ultimate goal of reaching them for the gospel is blocked. If at the very least by our attitude toward them. And most likely by our relationship with them as we tear them down and run them down and they know about it and hear about it. And so it's hard to... It's hard to win people to Christ if we're constantly alienating them and running them down. So we don't speak evil of people. We, we avoid quarreling. We avoid arguing. We avoid being contentious. We avoid uh, verbally and physically quarreling with people. We avoid that, that macho pride, you know, that uh, I'm not going to let nobody talk to me like that. You know, we avoid that 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 
that tendency to just stand up for our rights and not let anybody walk all over us and fight with them when they offend us and when they tear us down. Romans 12, 18 says, whenever possible, do your best to live at peace with everyone. So we're friendly, we're peaceful, we're considerate, even with the ungodly. Especially with the ungodly. We don't speak evil of the ungodly and tear them down. Now you can call an apple tree an apple tree, but we don't align them. We don't tear them down. We don't, we don't run them down. We, we want to respect them. We don't speak evil of them, and we don't fight with them. But on the contrary, he says, be gentle and show perfect courtesy. Stephen Cole is the, the pastor. I forget where he, he is, but I've started to really appreciate his sermons. He says this, it is more important to maintain good relations with your neighbor than to stand up for your rights. Did you hear that, Christian in America today? I'm addressing you as the Christian in America today. It's more important for you to maintain a good relationship with your neighbor than to stand up for your rights and fight with them. Why? Because it's through that relationship. Ultimately, our goal is not to make America a Christian nation. Our goal is to make the people in the nation of America Christians. Our goal is to go share the gospel. Our goal is to go share the light of the message of the grace and the mercy of Jesus. And so we get really focused on ourselves when we're like, you can't do that to me and you better stop doing that. And you're making my life uncomfortable and all that kind of stuff. And we start to fight with our society instead of just absorbing it. Instead of just saying, okay, I'll take it. I'll be meek. I'll be gentle. I'll be courteous. I won't speak evil of anyone. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just be humble. So that I can maintain a relationship with you for the, for the advancement of the gospel. And that's in saying be a doormat and all that kind of stuff in the extreme sense of the word. But it is saying, look, care more about your relationship with them and their salvation than you do how their life is affecting you. So we're gentle, we're kind, we're humble, we absorb the wrongs done to us, we're forbearing. It's the opposite. Gentleness here is, is the opposite of speaking evil and quarreling with people. We are even gentle when we're defending the faith. When you're sharing the faith, what does is, what is it say in 1 Peter? It says to always be ready to give an answer to anyone who, give, who asks you for the reason, the, the hope that you have, but do this with what? Gentleness and respect. We don't bombard people and be like, mm, I'm going to Jesus slap you. Right? We, we approach them with gentleness and kindness and respect and share the truth with them, maintaining a relationship with them. Not shaming them to their face, but speaking to them the truth, not compromising the truth. Doing it with gentleness and respect. We show perfect courtesy to everyone. This carries across the idea of being meek and mild, having a mild disposition, humility, being considerate. And this is the way we exemplify Christ, who was humble, who was meek, who came and submitted to earthly authorities who treated him incredibly unfairly, but he did it for the purposes of the kingdom. And we need to be meek, mild, gentle, courteous, and humble those ungodly around us just as our Savior was as well. And then he says to all people, especially to unbelievers, especially to the ungodly and those we don't think earn it or deserve it. To not do so is pride, selfish, and defensive. So, these first two verses help us see how we can live in an ungodly society around people who we don't agree with or make us mad or are even hostile toward us and we're tempted to be hostile toward them. We submit to our earthly authorities, even the ones we don't respect, as long as it's not calling us to contradict the word. And we're ready, to, ready for good works, we're ready to do every good work. We're gentle with the ungodly, we're, we're kind, we're not quarreling, we're not 
speaking evil of people and tearing them down. We're looking different than society around us. Because society around us is doing these things. We don't do them. We don't do them. So why? Why? Why do we do this? Well, <laughs> let me just give you a warning. This, verses 3 through 7, it is hard to not talk about this for another hour, and I won't, I promise. Because if you are a believer in Jesus, verses 4 through 7 is something you don't want to get out of and you just want to stay in. It's starting to get hot. It's, we talked about being here. Verses 4 through 7 are like a, a cold swimming pool on a hot day. It's like a couch on a rainy day. It's like a, we talked about vacation last week. It's like a vacation you don't want to get out of and never want to leave. When we understand what verses 4 through 7 are saying to us. Verses 4 through 7 are so incredibly amazing to us, but it gives us the motivation to live out, and the means, by the way, to live out verses 1 through 2. So I just want to read you verses 4 through 7, or 3 through 7 again. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. The scripture reminds us that these godly, this, this, these ungodly people that, that, that we're living around, we were once them. That used to be us. We were led astray. We were deceived. We were detesting others. We, we, were, we were disobeying. We, our sin nature was dictating our lives. We were held under the captivity of sin. And we, by all, if, if, not by God, if not for God's grace, we'd be living just like the people around us that we're starting to despise and want to create enemies of. You used to be, if you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian in here today, this is still you. But you used to be a slave to your sin. And the consequence of your sin, which is hell. You used to be trapped. You used to, you used to do things that, that, that tore down other people. And had a malicious life. And you were following your own selfish passions. And maybe some of these some of these things didn't really resonate with you because you got saved when you were younger. But I'm telling you something. Even at a young age, I can see it in my almost two-year-old. He is following his own desires. The sinful nature that is in him at birth because we're fallen mankind, it, it shows our, itself even in the youngest of children. So you might not have been, you know, running around doing all these ungodly things that adults do when you were a kid, but you were definitely following your, and you were separated from God because of your sin. We were all dead in our sin. But thank God for this conjunction is but a conjunction. Is that what it is? Thank God for this word but. But when the goodness and loving kindness of our Savior, Jesus Christ, appeared, now, did we run up to heaven and say, God, please come down and save us? No. He looked down at unworthy you, deserving of hell for eternity. He looked down at unworthy you and said, I am going to give them my grace. I am going to appear. Here's the third appearing. We talked about two appearings last week. Here's a third appearing. The grace of God appeared, and it came in the person of Jesus Christ. And he took your sin, all your sin that separated you from him, that caused you to be worthy of an eternal hell. He took on himself, and he was punished for it. And he was crucified for it, and he took your place. And he rose from the dead after that, showing that the sacrifice was complete, that if we will look in faith to him, all of our sin can be forgiven. And the grace of God appeared to us in the form of Jesus. 
Jesus is that grace. He came and, and, and he loved us when we were unlovable. He gave us grace when we were undeserving. And then at that time in your life when he brought you face to face with, with what he's done to you, through, done for you through somebody who was sharing the gospel with you, he appeared to you and showed you the gospel and brought you to faith in him that your sins might be forgiven. But don't, don't miss this. You didn't deserve it and you didn't ask for it. As a matter of fact, you were an enemy of his. You were an ungodly person. Running from him, doing your own thing, worthy of condemnation. But the goodness and loving kindness, that loving kindness is, is where we, that, the original word is where we get our word philanthropy, the love of mankind, the loving kindness of, of God. He loved us so much that he gave us grace. He saved us when we were undeserved. And then it goes on. I mean, we could, we could swim in this pool for a long time. But we won't. <laughs> he saved us not because of works done by us, in righteousness, by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. He saved you not by anything that you did. But only according to his mercy. Isn't that wonderful? He didn't love you because you were lovable. He loved you because he is love. If you notice, you read this passage, all of this working are things done to us, not things that we did to ourselves. It doesn't say you, you know, you got saved because, you know, you went down the aisle one day. It doesn't say you started to live a Christian life because you just decided to pull up the bootstraps and start doing good things. It says, grace appeared. He saved you, and he regenerated you, and he is renewing you, and he gave you the Holy Spirit, and he is giving you eternal life and making you heirs. He's doing all this. We didn't deserve it. And so how does, that, how does that help us live this life? Christian, listen. When you, when you realize that Jesus acted in grace to you, you will act in grace to others. <clears throat> and if you're not acting in grace to others, I'm going to be very bold and say this. You don't understand the grace of Jesus for you. You don't get it. When we look at, and, and we all struggle with that, I think, but when we look at this ungodly society and we start to make them enemies instead of the mission field, we are forgetting that we used to be just like them and except for the grace of God appearing, not on anything that we have done, except for his grace appearing, we'd be just like them. So we should hurt for them. We should, we should love them. We should look at them and not look at their actions that, that cause us to, to want to say, I don't like you. Get away from you. I want to talk bad about you. I want to fight with you. I don't want to be courteous to you. I don't want to be gentle with you. We look at them and go, oh my goodness, they are in need of the, the, the grace of God. The same grace that touched me. They need. And when we look at them, they don't become our enemies, but they become objects of love and almost pity. Then we want to do whatever we can to be vessels of his grace to them. So I would I would go so far as to say that if you're getting mad at society and mad at leaders and all that kind of stuff, I know there's some righteous reasons to be mad at things. I, I get that. But if your disposition towards society as a whole is, is, is they're my enemy, and I want to just kind of get away from them, and I look down upon them, you're not focused on their salvation. You're focused on your comfort.
And you're not focused on who you were. You're just focused on who you are now. Who we are is great. We were just like them. It's only by His grace if we're not anymore. They need the grace of God. Let me give you a few little applications before I read one more passage. The, this should encourage us. Verse 3 should encourage us that, that if we were like that, that even this ungodly society, people in there can be saved. The grace of God can touch them and change them. When, when the Holy Spirit as he says, comes in and regenerates us and renews us, it shows this world the transforming power of the gospel, and we look different in the world around us. We see the power of the gospel, and it makes the gospel that much more real. And two other things, and then I want to read some words of Jesus. Believer, this world is not your home. The scripture says that we are aliens and strangers in this world. And so when this godless society is making it very uncomfortable for you to live in your temporary home, in your temporary stay before you get to your eternal home, why, why should we get our feathers all ruffled in that? There's going to be a day where believers are going to live in joy and peace and harmony and worship and all that with forever with our Father. Worshiping the Lamb. We're just passing through here. So instead of letting this ungodly world just make you want to stay here longer and make life awesome here until we get to where, yeah, it's going to be awesome one day. You know what I'm saying? We're just passing through. So... The other thing is good works and good deeds and loving with grace is, is really what you were saved for. And if you're not doing it, then you're disobeying and you're despising the work. You're despising the, the work of Christ for you. He saved you to go love this world in grace. And if you're not doing it, you're despising what he saved you for. And there's really no other way to say that. So I want to read the passage that we talked about in youth this morning. As we close, Luke chapter 6. This is Jesus. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Lord God, um, for those who have ears to hear, these are heavy, heavy words. To lives whose opinions of others are shaped by so many other than your word. And so God, my simple prayer today that you 
would overwhelm us with the grace that we have been shown in Christ. That we may go to this godless society around us and show grace. That being one who was undeserving, that we would go give grace to the undeserving. That those who we disrespect, we go love, do good to. That we would be zealous to show the grace and mercy of God through our lives. We would be less focused on ourselves and more focused on others. That we would respond with grace. So God, I really believe that after a message like this, there are two types of people in this room. And I pray you speak to us both. That there are some who have never been saved. They've never trusted Christ as their Savior. They've ever experienced the grace and mercy of forgiven sin through trusting you. And I pray you bring salvation to those who need it. Many of us, the rest of us, need to be moved to go love this world with grace. So Lord, I pray you move us to that, motivated by how you love us in grace. So God, that's my prayer for us body of believers that we call ours, yours. And so, however you want to respond this morning, I'll be down here at the front. If you want to come talk or pray, I'll be here. The altar is open to pray if you'd like to. Make a decision at your seat. Deal with the Lord at your seat. Pray at your seat. I pray that we just, we don't leave this place changed or unmoved by the truth of God's word. So as we respond, let's stand together and sing together. You respond as God leads you to. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh That, that you've uh, with us today. I know some of you are here for the graduate for the graduates today, and so that means that you graduates. Some of you will eat well today. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Congratulations, and uh, so glad that that you're you're here today. Uh, looking forward to a great week next week. I hope to see you all back. Have a blessed week. God bless you.